why would you ever need any more news sources that are out there we're about to put everybody to sleep out there we're about to put the night night on all the news sources that are out there kind of like steph curry does at the end of a game according to the center for disease control there was a study that was conducted over 36 states in the united states over the period of 2017 to 2019 the results showed that the six most frequent underlying causes of maternal related deaths were and i note here 22.7 percent were mental health conditions 13.17 13.7 percent were hemorrhaging cardiac and coronary conditions uh, resulted in 12.8 percent infections were 9.2 thrombolic embolism 8.7 and cardiomyopathy was 8.5. Uh, this accounts for over 75% of pregnancy-related deaths. Do we care about women? You know we did a show a couple of weeks ago on men. I don't want you guys to get the wrong impression about this show. Jason and I, we're gentlemen. We care about everybody. And so we're going to be talking about pregnancy-related deaths today. Jason's going to come in and bring some insights here in just a few moments. But in order for us to do that, we got to actually start the show and then we got to get him on the show. And so we're headed that direction very quickly here. You're watching the Way Forward Weekend Edition. Looking forward to it. Hello, sir. Good morning. Good morning. Well, we are back on another show, and uh, I guess we survived last week's uh, rapping for Jesus. <laughs> yes, that was. I think we laughed the most on that one. Uh, probably so. I know I definitely laughed. I didn't laugh as much on on the show, but I laughed uh, until I almost fell out of my chair um, before the show. And so, <laughs> right. yeah, there's that. Yeah, you can't help it. When you just see something like like that, it's like it's better to laugh than anything else. You just kind of like, oh, man. I agree. I agree. To something like this, so that's the the, the diversity of our show. The yeah, the broad range of things. I mean, this is kind of like the Forrest Gump of live stream shows because you never know what you're going to get. You never know what you're going to get. And, and I'm good important. with that. It's important. I think there's a lot um the church needs to talk about with yes and i think <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> i think we can get so siloed and into our own things from time to time that we forget that there's a broader perspective on things that are out there and there's a broader conversation that's going on sometimes conversations that we don't even know are going on and so it's a good opportunity for educator to educate ourselves on a subject matter that's out there and you brought this one to my attention and as i started reading i thought is this really something that we should be talking about and as i began to read more and study more about it i thought this is something that we should be talking about and uh i don't know where it fits in the context of everything that goes on in the life and conversation of the church but it does fit somewhere oh it it does um and maybe we can get into this in a minute but i i think when you start talking about the womb in general so that's your mm -hmm. broad topic right it's, it's the womb and and when you go back to Genesis 3, uh, you're introduced to the womb and, and some of the complications that are going to come because of the result of the fall. From there on, the discussion now uh, can go all kinds of different directions and affects uh, families in the church, affects women in the church, children in the church. Um, it affects our communities. And so um, this is very much a topic that um, fits inside the lives that, that you and I are trying to encourage and edify and help the church move forward on. And you'll be surprised that the reason why it, uh, it's not being talked about um, uh, is actually kind of surprising, I think, in the church is because I just I don't know if it's a, a matter of relevance or if it's a matter of being fearful to talk about it. Mm -hmm. uh, you start dealing with with some of these issues and you open a can of worms, just, just for instance, of 
just to deal with infertility, for instance, right? That's part of the womb. Um, yeah. That's an interesting topic. Now you start talking about uh, mortality, uh, maternal um, mortality rates, and you're like, that's a problem. That's an issue in America. And actually you find out that America leads developed nations in this. So yeah. It's that was the part that was actually pretty shocking to me because I'll actually, I'll put a sound bite on here in just a few moments and we'll get to that. But that was the part that was shocking to me is that I think some of the underlying causes and factors that we have here in the United States also exist in other first world countries. And yeah. yet there's a distinction here. Uh, and so I wanted to look at that uh, yeah. throughout our conversation today yeah. as well. So without further ado, let me just go ahead and put our top story for today. Thank you guys for watching. The comment section is turned on. Let you guys know that you're we're streaming on various platforms. And so drop a comment in the comment section. And if it's appropriate, <laughs> we will put it up on the screen. If it's not appropriate, then keep that to yourself. <laughs> uh, you can make the comment, but it's just not going to show up on the screen. All of that activity lets people know that people are watching this and there's something going on. We're just going to trick the algorithm into thinking, hey, we need to get everybody to rush over there. And then we're going to share the gospel with you. And so, Jason, yeah. if you would go ahead and lead us in prayer as we get started past the plumber. Yeah. Uh, and then we'll, we'll do some sound bites here. Okay. Father Henry, thank you so much for the grace and the mercy you've given us this morning to get up. And we just thank you for the opportunity to talk about an, an, an issue that um, is inside the church, inside of our communities, inside our homes. Um, it's an issue that you are sovereign over and that you are participating in. And so just give us wisdom and how we direct our conversation and how we can edify the church to move forward. We ask in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. All right. We'll get back to some of your notes that you've put into the show. And I, I put the ERLC article in the show notes for today. So check that out, folks. Know that we're not just we're not just making stuff up over here. In fact, this is cancel CNN, cancel Fox News, cancel all the rest of that stuff. Get your news from here now. All right. So this is uh, I think this is PBS who is reporting this and. Uh, sobering facts. The United States has the worst rate of mothers dying during pregnancy, childbirth, or postpartum than any country in the developed world. The maternal mortality rate is 26 women for every 100,000 live births in the U.S. NPR and ProPublica last week published a joint investigation into the reasons behind this problem. And ProPublica reporter Nina Martin joins me from Oakland, California, to discuss what they found. First of all, put that number into perspective for us. 26 out of 100,000 doesn't sound like How does that stack up against the rest of uh, who we compare ourselves to? Uh, 26 out of 100,000 translates to 7,900 women a year in the U.S., which compares to... Seven out of 100,000 in Canada. I think it's four out of 100,000 in most of the Scandinavian countries. You had uh, a character in this uh, tragic story. About okay, so we're going to tell a story about a neonatal nurse, but let's just wrestle for just a moment with the gravity of those numbers in uh, comparing ourselves to other places in the world. Why are we so offset, Jason? Well, the sad reality is those numbers are actually higher now. In 2023, it's it's over a thousand. Um, we're trending uh, the wrong direction. We're trending the wrong direction. We're actually up over 1,200 uh, a year, which puts us somewhere closer to to the high 20, uh, 30, closer to 30s um, per 100,000. Um, so you mentioned some of it, right? Um, obviously, American women are. Uh, so I'm speaking generally from a, a cultural perspective, you know, I'm kind of stepping outside of of um, uh, the church for a moment. But, you know, in our lifestyle, women are, are getting married a little bit later. Uh, they're having children um, later in age. Um, also, it's, it's no um, secret that Americans are heavier in general. And so are our women. And um, and so some of that plays into the. Uh, issue. We also have um, issues where um, higher rates of hypertension and diabetes among women, um, and you are, you are, or you would be derelict maybe to not consider the fact that um, if you were to look at some of these cases, how often they're happening inside of uh, impoverished communities. Um, so the poverty is playing a factor, getting proper health care. 
Uh, the article I sent you, the ERLC highlighted that um, it was it was it twice as many African American women are going to die or something like that from mm -hmm. this, um, and and they're dying from the cardiac side of it, you know, because there's four there's four things that's mentioned. It's it's cardiac, it's hemorrhaging, it's mental illness, um, and then it's it, it's a uh, uh, am, uh, and like an aneurysm, like a, mm -hmm. a blood clot. Um, and you're finding that white non-Hispanic women are dying the most from mental illness. Mental, yeah. Um, and then you're finding that African-American women are dying from the cardiac coronary. And then you're finding um, that the Asian women are dying from the hemorrhaging. Uh, I, I cannot begin to tell you why <laughs> that's the case, but that's how the, that's how the numbers are lining up. And um, And so this is something that's affecting women in our community in our church and it's it's on the trend up mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not going down and it hasn't been going down for the last to see five years or so yeah jason i wanted to ask you a question i know that you know we're two men who are sitting here having this discussion about women's right. health <clears throat> excuse me and for a lot of people they would just tune that off and be like man you guys don't know anything um but here we are seeking to know and seeking to find answers right. and seeking to uh right contend that the church should partition some attention to this issue um do you think some of the extremism of the american culture has factored into some of those numbers and and for instance what i mean by that is we have women who are waiting until they're older to get married whereas perhaps in other countries the traditional and i would say biblical norm is that you know, once you're of marrying age, then there's a potential and a possibility there for you to begin families and marriages and those types of things. We've delayed that sort of to an extreme degree in, in America. And we know that the, the later that women wait to have children, the more likely yes, they are to experience yeah. complications uh, there. Um, and some of the, the extreme, you know, positions that we have with regards to family and children, mm -hmm. i.e. the word that starts with an A. And gets you banned <laughs> for talking about it. Yeah. Um, do you think that that factors in to women's health in any significant manner? And I know you have only have to spec speculate there, but yeah. What are your thoughts? Well, so here's here's what we're doing, right? We're we're two pastors who are trying to minister well to our our women in church and our families in church, right? And and when you have say one pass away because of more. Um, maternal mortality issues that that is a shock because you would think in a developed nation that that that, that this wouldn't happen right um so that so just to clarify why we're talking about it and i think why we should be talking about it is we pastor women and families who have who are making families and this has become a part of it and we have a theology of the womb and we've got to have an answer and we've got to have a way to talk about this um, as far as the street extremism in the culture, absolutely. The I was just thinking this morning, the stress levels alone are off the charts. It's amazing that we're not having more <laughs> miscarriages just because the the overall stress levels in, in the world right now, people are so wound up. It's insane. Um, you've got incidences happening all over the place on planes, on buses where um, we are just I mean, our schools. Blood, yeah, our schools. Our blood pressure is up. We are ready to pull the trigger at any moment. Um, stress is a big, big deal on women who are who are um, pregnant. Massive deal. Um, I remember when uh, Ethan, Stacy, was pregnant with Ethan, and and uh, we had lost her brother uh, to an illness. I mean, we, we just one of the things we worried about was the the stress of walking through that illness with him, and then and then having to to do his funeral and a month later, Ethan be born. How is that going to impact Stacy? You know, just the mm, stress of, yes, um, and, and dealing with, with, with that. Uh, second of all, I, I do think the the radical nature of this idea that I'm I'm going to live for myself for my 20s and then start having children in my 30s. Uh, yeah, I, I think I think medically, doctors would prefer you to have your children younger. Um, uh, we're even told the same thing when we had Elias. We were 40 years old. Right. And and we were even told at 40 that, hey, look, your your risk of something going wrong shoots up exponentially. 
after 40 sure. years old. Sure. So, so we've got to be on the lookout for, you know, your blood pressure. We got to look out for the baby's uh, stuff. And, and we went through way more hoops than we did when we were 26 having children. Um, and so um, this, I, I think the, the idea <coughs> of feminism that tells women that you need to be career oriented first, you need to be self-made first, you need to be these things first. Mm. Um, and, and having children um, delays that or hinders that or does something with that, I think that plays a part. I don't know how much it plays into it, but definitely plays a part. Yeah, it'd be hard to notice statistic on that. But let's continue with the story and we'll see. Uh, he's going to tell a firsthand story. And I think there's some more important information that we can get from this. Comment section is turned on. You guys jump into the discussion. Let me know what you think. A neonatal nurse, I mean, someone who works around babies her whole life, and she's the central character in your story that ends up highlighting so much of what's wrong in the system. By textbook, she had a very good pregnancy. She was healthy. She did everything right. She had access to good health care. She delivered the baby well. And yet, how is it possible that she's one of the people that ends up as one of these statistics? I think there's a lot of uh, people who assume that women who die in childbirth or pregnancy related causes in the US are um, sort of, uh, you know, they're poor, they have bad health care, they have pre existing conditions, they are unhealthy, they don't get good prenatal care. There's all kinds of things that, you know, that we sort of assume are the explanations. And, and Lauren had all of those things. I think that one of the big issues that we haven't really looked at in this country is so much around maternal care is everybody sort of said, oh, look, we're so much better than we used to be. Women used to die, you know, 800 women in this country used to die every day in childbirth. We've licked that problem. And meanwhile, babies are dying. And so let's focus on the babies. But we've sort of taken the, uh, our eye off of maternal health. And so we, we don't really think about the kinds of safety, really basic safety things that need to be put in place just to keep moms safe. All right. I'm going to stop you there. I'm going to stop you there, Nina. I'm going to stop you with that look on your face, Nina, because we're coming back to you. But let me. Well, I'm assuming that mom now they have they have they have numbers, right? Like so a maternal death rate um, is not I think one of the things I also assume is that mom dies immediately after childbirth. But that's not often the case. That's mm -hmm. that's really that that doesn't happen very often at all. Within 24 hours, if there's a bleeding issue, mom might pass away. But they go up to 42 days past um, childbirth, and they count that as well. You're, you're talking over a month. And then they have a late, they call it something like a late-term maternity death that goes after 42 days. So he, something you've got to keep in mind when we look at our numbers in the United States, because other developed nations don't do this, they have different boxes they check. And they don't include the stuff that we include. Okay. So, okay. Is, okay. That's good to know. That's good. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, the economist, I, I put on, um, I believe I put on uh, the notes. The economist makes a note of this. Uh, why are so many American women dying? And they do make a note that the way that it is researched in other developed nations is not the same the way we research it here. We check more boxes and we include more things. So our numbers are going to look a little different. I, I don't want to excuse that and say we don't have an issue, but that just keep that in mind as you're looking at those numbers. But we also look at death rates. Those notes are at the bottom of the screen. Past, past um, uh, these, uh, past the, the birth date. So we're going over a month, 42 days plus, and counting anything that's connected to the birth itself. So that's where you get postpartum depression, which Post, is a yeah. massive mm -hmm. deal, a massive deal. Um with with women in the, in the church and i'll tell you if the church has dropped the ball on on something i would think this is the one where they where they have missed it um where um we have not adequately dealt with the uh significance of what a woman's body goes through after she delivers counting some of those hormones and not dismissing it as you know something else which is i think what's been done in the past um, and so, you know, I don't know what happened to this neonatal nurse, but if she suffered from postpartum, um, that's a real significant issue. That is, 
that is something of the debate that happens inside of, you know, biblical counseling versus secular counseling type stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and until Stacy and I walked through some of that, you know, our eyes were really opened about just how dark um, postpartum can be after you have a child and what your body, what her body's going through. You got to think about uh, William Couture, Dr. William Couture at Southern Seminary. I remember I had a really good conversation with this because he was talking about how the women's, the women's body <clears throat> goes from not producing as many hormones, right? Cause the baby's up there and they've got to, the body's got to level off estrogen and all that stuff to give the baby a chance to do what baby's got to do. Baby gets born and all of a sudden, sometimes the body is flooded with all of these hormones all at once. And I'm sorry, but if you've ever been around a woman who's battling, say, a, a very serious period or, or has got a hormonal imbalance with a thyroid or something like that, it is it is crazy. <laughs> like it's on them. It's crazy on them. And they don't know if they're yeah. coming or going. It's not it's not their fault. They will even tell you at times that I don't know why I'm so upset. I don't know why I'm so anxious or I don't know why I'm so angry. And, and you find out that you have this, you know, uh, you have these hormones flooding your system. Well, that's not a matter of I don't think entirely of, of the heart, though. There's some heart issues there, some some spiritual things there. You have to take into account those hormones. Um, that's a, that's a big deal. So uh, if you don't, if you don't mind me asking, let me just kind of ask one more question here. As you're going through that, being a pastor, understanding the biblical side of things, the heart side of things, what were some things that were helpful? Cause I, I would imagine that at some point, maybe somebody will stumble upon this episode and they will look at it and they will say, Hey, they're, they're, they're touching an issue that is related to somebody that either I'm directly involved with or somebody that I've known about. And this might be something helpful that uh, they could sh should consider because this is what Jason and his wife did. Now, I say all that knowing that um, we could do a whole another episode and I would probably talk the entire episode about infertility and kind of right. how we came about right. adoption and, and those sort of things. Um, and so this aspect, at least, we did not go through. And so yeah. I'm, I'm relying upon your your wisdom yeah. and your instruction with regards to these matters. So I, I'm just curious to know what, what were things that were helpful in your family uh, for you and Stacy as you were moving forward? Well, I first, I, I think very first is just being willing to acknowledge it. First and foremost, okay. this is not just like, this is not just a lack of faith or this is not just, you know, a, um, a spiritual issue or a sin issue, something like that, that, that there are some physical things happening. Um, and, and we were in a time when, when Stacy and she didn't battle it as hard as some other women did, but she, she did have some of it and she recognized, man, I'm not myself. I'm not, I'm not. And, and, and Stacy, I'm going to tell you, Stacy is a knockout mom. Like when it comes to our kids and, and being a mother and doing all that, I mean, hands down, um, especially when it comes to taking care of the baby. And I mean, she would put herself in front of a bus, you know what I'm saying? To, to, to protect the child and, and be with her. So, we noticed right off the, the bat just a little bit that, hey, something's not right. The second thing was talking to somebody who really knows what they're talking about. <laughs> like uh, Dr. Crutcher at Southern was so helpful. Uh, he's with the Lord now. Um, but when he was there and we were talking to him and we were just kind of discussing some things and he was so helpful to help us understand what's going on in the body, what's going on inside of her um, and giving us some things to help us, you know, uh, to not overreact about the, how do you receive a blow? You know what I'm saying? Like when you're, you're not being yourself and you just can't react to somebody being not themselves. You've got to be able to, to, you know, to what Jesus would say to your enemy, like, you know, turn the other cheek type thing. Right. Well, and inside of a, a relationship that's battling some of these issues, you're going to have to learn to, to receive some things and take some things and, and deal with some things and then set up a, um, a pattern to to kind of help um, get you through the day. And then thirdly, don't be afraid to talk to your doctor about it. Like that, that's not hands off. That's not hands mm -hmm. off. That's that is um, making sure that your your people who helped deliver your baby. Now, with uh, I remember when um, uh, we've, we've had two uh, OBs that we really, really enjoyed. Uh, Dr. Buck was one of them in Louisville and there's another lady in, um, in Minnesota uh, and they were so aware and attentive and hands-on and um, 
and ask really good questions and pursue things. And I would say if, if there's an argument for the people who are, are not getting that kind of care, um, and this is what scares me about like state care and Obamacare and all that is I know the idea is that if we can give health care to everybody, everybody will be taken care of. But not all health care is the same. And if you've only got 15 minutes to go in there and say, hey, look, uh, here's what I'm dealing with. They'll pop you a pill, get on, move you on your way. And it becomes like this assembly line. That's not helpful. Uh, the two OBs that we had who were incredibly careful and, and, and took time, you know, it, the, the appointment took longer than 15 minutes. It maybe took 20 or 30 minutes, but they asked really good questions and they cared. And it was, it was really helpful to our Stacy. Mm -hmm. And, and so that's why I don't, I don't like the umbrella of, Hey, let's just get everybody under healthcare and then spit them out to these health professionals and they'll take care of it. Cause we assume all healthcare is equal. That's not the case. Um, yeah. This is not the case. Uh, and it's, we, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I was going to say at some point we have to talk about Serena Williams, but I'm going to let this go on a little bit farther and then I'll just, I'll kind of let you be thinking about that because she's already mentioned Nina who has this mm -hmm. wonderful look on her face. Nina has already mentioned that this is something that cuts across ethnic lines and irrespective mm -hmm. of one's income and education level. Um, this is an issue that needs to be addressed. And so I'm going to let her finish what it is that she's saying. Got a couple of good things that she's got still to say. And, and uh, that's a really big part of what's happening. It's that it's, it's that 60% of the deaths in the U S at least are preventable. What you also seem to highlight is that that, that is not st a standard hospital protocol to deal with complications. So really the ones that could have been small and prevent death end up cascading out of control into something much bigger. Yes. So again, um, none of this is, you know, the, the things that need to be done to prevent um, uh, women from dying or nearly dying in childbirth in the U.S. are pretty well known. What Lauren had was a, a condition called preeclampsia. 200,000 women a year develop preeclampsia in the U.S. It's textbook, it's basic to OBGYN care, and everybody knows what you're supposed to do. Uh, you know, it's not that her, her caregivers weren't good doctors, but they didn't recognize what was going on because they weren't on the same page about, you know, what the standards are and what we should do when certain standards hit. And overall in the U.S., I think that this is a problem because um, maternal complications um, are thought not to be very common, but they're actually much more common than, than, than doctors um, and nurses realize. All right, I'm going to stop her there and actually jump out of that screen because I wanted to ask, this is kind of the counterpoint to what you were just talking about, Jason. If we had standardized health care, if we had a system where everybody knew, okay, these are the common factors, here are the common things that we might see, here's the treatment methodology, then I think maybe she would put that in the category of pre preventable because depending on who you go to, if it's a, sort of a checkerboard approach to um, health care, they may not treat it the same way. Well, yeah, I, I, what I think is you would think that the way the medical field is set up in the United States right now, the doctors are are being trained to be, uh, I mean, superb doctors. I mean, we're one of the most developed we are the most developed nation in the world and um, and we, we, we have superb medical schools. And yet um, when the state gets involved and starts putting out this idea that, Hey, we can just take all these medical professionals and, and, um, and put them into um, our, and it started helping our, our, have our people go through standardized medical care. The issue becomes the people become like sheep. You just get them in, get 15 minutes in and get them out. And we're not paying attention. And, and even though the standards for the state might be there, the standards may not be as, uh, as careful as, say, a doctor um, who's really on his game or she's really on her game. Um, for instance, there's a, there's a reason why our congressional leaders go to certain doctors while you and I go to other doctors. Mm. <laughs> right? so, so Tell us why that is. Yeah, we're not going to get those doctors that our congressional leaders are going to. We're not going to get those doctors. Hmm. We're going to get the other ones who are going to ship us through because they're going to get paid. And I'm sorry, I, this is this idea of, of developing a utopia in America. It's, it's absolute nonsense. The 
the, we need doctors who know what they're doing. Pre, like she said, preeclampsia is pretty standard. We're told from the moment Stacy was diagnosed as pregnant, right? Preeclampsia was on the table, especially with Elias when she was 40. She's mm-hmm. like, look, we're going to be, we're going to be watching this from day one. Right. And, <coughs> and we're going to assume that every doctor is being told that, especially with uh, pediatrics and OBs that look, preeclampsia is you, it's on the table. The moment you, you are diagnosing pregnancy, um, you need to be watching for this. Uh, but, but doctors don't, even with a unified health care, like we have in the United States, which is still for the most part unified, um, they don't follow it necessarily. Mm. So, like I said, there's a difference between the doctors who go to congressional doctors. They, they go to the versus the ones we go to. I'm sorry. Yeah. And, in, and in rural communities and in urban communities, uh, those doctors aren't coming down there over here. Um, so, I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to knock on my doc. I, you know, I don't, I don't have any complaints against my doctors in Litchfield. I, I've, the doctor who delivered Elias, uh, the two nurses actually, he, he skirted in a bit late, but, but the two nurses took care of it and, and did very, very well, you know, and, and we were in good hands and, and didn't have any problems whatsoever. Um, but I'll tell you right now, our doctors here are outnumbered by a ton mm. and uh, they don't have the support that other doctors have. Um, they don't have the resources and we oftentimes have to helicopter people or ship people to Springfield or St. Louis um, because of where we are in, in Litchfield. Though all those factors play into um, maternal health care and stuff like that. Sure, sure. Well, very complicated issue. You've got, and I mentioned it before, like Serena Williams, greatest women's, arguably the greatest women's tennis player of all time. All time. Who had her complications, uh, severe complications in uh, the birth of her children. Um, and so we know that it's an issue that can face those who even have access to adequate and we would say first rate health care. Um, and so this is something that the ERLC in their article, and I'll just read this uh, because uh, we'd mentioned it. But at the end of the ERLC article, and we can kind of turn the page here, it says when Christians show that they care about women and are broken over the issues that arise when women don't receive the care that they need, the world sees a little more clearly that God cares for women. He cares for the broken. He cares for the hurting. As Christ's ambassadors, call, God calls the church to love women, babies, families, and to be conduits of life. And the article goes on to say, pregnant women and families, healthcare providers, hospital, healthcare systems, and states and communities can all work together to reduce the maternal mortality rates and as churches invest themselves in their communities and pursue the well-being of their cities, a la Jeremiah 29, 4 through 7, they are uniquely positioned as a source of hope and light. And so let's turn the corner now, Jason, and let's talk about the way forward for the church and for God's people in relationship to this issue. Well, I, I think so working backwards a little bit, right? So they said when the, when the church begins to make sure that these people have care and, and are properly taken care of, right? That's the, that's the, um, I would say, if you're going to have a, say a triangle, right? That's the peak, right? We want to get to the place where we're actually applying the gospel to these situations. Uh, but before we get, we get to that application, I just think that the womb probably needs to be talked about more inside of church. When, when we talk about the womb um, as a broad concept, concept god gave the womb to bring life you know he, he told uh, adam and eve be fruitful and multiply and, mm-hmm. and so uh the blessing is supposed to come from the womb is this life is supposed to come but when you get to genesis 3 and you realize that that uh that you're going to struggle in childbearing right there are a myriad of issues that come with that statement you're going to have that you're going to, it's not going to, we, we typically say, well, that's why women have pain inside of their childhood. Well, it goes beyond just physical pain of bearing children. It goes beyond the fact that here, this thing, the womb is supposed to bring life. And sometimes it brings death or sometimes it brings disability. Um, or sometimes 
it, it, it brings um, uh, discouragement and, and complications and all that kind of kind of stuff. And so as the church leaders, we have to have a better, I think, theology of the womb and understand that we're sitting there counseling mm, families, like um, families about these issues that we're not just separating that the biological from the theological that, hey, wait a minute, these two are intertwined together because we're both um, soul and body. And so um, I think that's the first start. Pastors need to have a better theological understanding of the womb and the complications that come from it um, so that you guard your wisdom a little bit better when you begin to talk about infertility and you begin to talk about um, uh, complications that come. Because the last thing you want to tell a woman who's struggling to say with infertility or um, childbearing is that, you know, you're cursed or something because um, <laughs> you just haven't thought through all the issues that come with Genesis 3, 15, uh, 14 and 15. Right. Yeah. So that's the first. The second thing is, is, is that we are we are adamantly pro-life. Right. Uh, we are all about life. And so that we want to do everything we can to not only ensure that the baby is born, but that life is protected on both sides, right? We want to we want to make sure that uh, that baby has a a place in this world, and that mama is able to to be there. Which means this is where the application of the church, being mindful about your community and the resources needed to make sure that 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 these moms and their families are cared for properly. Um, we don't have to be trained to be doctors, right? Even though it'd be great if more doctors were a part of your congregation because uh, they could be a part of it. But you could definitely build relationships with your hospital. One of the things that yeah. we've done here is, is we have a really good relationship with St. Francis. And, uh, and um, there have been times when we've co-opted with St. Francis to talk about things like this, whether it's been mental health issues or, or things of that nature. But having a really good relationship with your hospital is is helpful to the church and to these moms and to get these moms and these families exposed to as much care as possible. Um, especially when it comes to the mental health stuff, you know, you're hoping mm -hmm. that they're getting to the doctor and they're getting that care about the, 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 the cardio uh, issues and the, and the, uh, and the emblem issues or the aneurysm issues. Um, I'm not so sure, even though the doctors talk about it, enough is given to the postpartum depression stuff. Yeah, that. that's that's one of those that I think the church comes in and, you know, aside from and maybe in conjunction with providing meals for the family. But you also yeah. begin to have an active interest in right. the health of the family. And um, that becomes the totality in which, like you were saying, not everybody's going to be a doctor. But right. at the same time, everybody can care and hold the rope at some Man. level. Just how are you doing? Family how support. You, doing? you good? You good? And, and let's talk about your day. Let's talk about how you're feeling when you get up and and just being able to spot when when maybe mama's not herself or maybe mama's overwhelmed or or how's the church come alongside and help mama who's overwhelmed and daddy, you know, uh, yeah. and, and daddy, daddy, you know, he's sitting there trying to to figure this whole thing out, too, and, and having that community support uh, and then being willing to say, hey, look, it's time that we go see somebody who who knows more about this and, and talk about it. I, I think that's, again, having that relationship with um, your hospital is extremely important. Mm -hmm. So. Fantastic. We are right at the, the nose here at 39 minutes. And so a uh, great show. I think this is one that we keep up because it's evergreen because it's a subject matter that we will reference time and time again either yeah. through other shows that we're doing, but uh, it'll be a place saver for some things that I think are discussion pieces that we need to have and continue to have in the church. So Jason, once again, thank you so much for your time. Thank you um, for your wisdom related to this issue and sharing a lot. I'll let, I'll let you share a lot today because you've got a lot of experience in this area. So for those of you who are watching the show, before we leave this show, please remember it's not the way it's the way forward show, not the Erskine music show. Got the wrong tag up there, <laughs> but um, let me go ahead and get the right one up there. This is the way forward show on the weekends. Remember to subscribe to the channel. If you've not done that already, uh, you can easily do that. Have an opportunity to see a notification that comes up and you won't miss a single one of the episodes. We never know where we're going to go and what we're going to talk about on this. So please remember to do this. 
All right, my friend. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we're going to get out of here. As soon as I can find that bar. <laughs> It's somewhere. Oh, there you go. God bless you guys. Thank you so much. Way Forward Show.